It is now 11 a.m. Calling the roll for the Monday, November 26th Board of Control meeting. We have Nan Baker, Here. Dale Miller, Here. Trevor Mackler serving as an alternate for Dan Brady, Here. Mike Dever, Here. Armin Budish, Here. Dennis Kennedy, Here. Lenora Lockett. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Minutes from November 19th. Are there any changes, comments? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? The minutes are approved. Any public comment? No public comment at this time. And no tabled items? And no tabled items. Okay, let's start. First item on the agenda, BC 2018-834, <coughs> Department of Public Works, recommending an award on requisition 43637 and enter into a contract with Industrial First, Inc. in the amount not to exceed $331 and uh, $331,830 for roof maintenance services for various county buildings. And it's for the period December 1st, 2018 through November 30th, 2021. Good morning, Matt Reimer for the Department of Public Works. Uh, this contract uh, provides for roof maintenance services for all of our county buildings. It includes annual roof inspections and reporting, routine maintenance repairs, and emergency roof leak repairs. Uh, this procurement was a uh, request for bid. Uh, two bids were received, and the bid closed on October 24th of this year. Uh, per the uh, solicitation's evaluation criteria, the lowest and best uh, vendor was uh, selected, and that is what is recommended here today, Industrial First, and it can answer any of your questions. Thank you. Any questions? Councilman Miller. Who provided the other bid and how much? The other bid was... Excuse me, let me get their name correctly. Uh, Warren Roofing. And the how much is a two-part question. So this award amount, Councilman, is a not to exceed amount. So the evaluation criteria is based on labor rate per the, uh, per the bid. And the difference was in the hourly rates. Um, they had the same field technician uh, uh, hourly rate, but it was the, uh, um, excuse me, the three-year average of the field technician uh, right, but they had a difference in assistant field technician, and that was the difference in the uh, in the proposed value. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-835, Department of Information Technology, recommending an award on requisition 42790 and to enter into a contract with Solix Technologies, Inc. in the amount not to exceed $469,658 for the provision of a data lake repository tool. And it's for the period November 26, 2018 through November 25, 2020. Good morning, Janelle Green, Department of IT. Uh, this item is for a contract with Solix Technologies, again, for the Data Lake Repository Tool. This is something that is uh, used with the ERP system to archive our legacy systems and still have it um, readily accessible um, via um, data management tools um, for people that need to access the data. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. McLean. Janelle, was this the lowest out of the five bids? Yes, and then there were some negotiations to bring it down some, too. Potential bid, it was at 48. Um, so that's what was on our, yeah. that was on our um, plan holders list. So we had some go out, and we had some, about five come in. Hmm? Councilman Miller. Could you explain the part about 419658 dollars from the ERP general fund and, and 50000 from the general fund? Sure. Just in looking at the project, um, some of our project managers have seen that there may be some work that requires some um, work that's not related to ERP in order to get it cohesively um, to house the data. So that's why we looked at some time and materials costs, um, the, which we have in there about $50,000 um, in the event um, that we have some items come up. Um, if we don't utilize those funds, it's a not to exceed, so we can um, recoup that money back from the vendor. Okay. okay. And uh, I've been uh, briefed by your staff on this matter, and, and it appears that the uh, Alternatives to the data lake are much more expensive, and, and it looks like uh, 
it's just been well thought out. So I, I support the Great. Item. Thanks. Thank you. Councilwoman Baker. I have the same question. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-836, Department of Information Technology, submitting an amendment to a contract with Unify Solutions, Inc. for SAP Human Capital Management Support Services. And it's for the period July 1st, 2017 through December 31st, 2019, for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $25,000. Janelle Green, Department of IT. Um, this is for uh, data migration work um, that we have uh, consultants from Unify Solutions um, to migrate the data from our current systems over into the ERP. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? <coughs> Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-837, Department of Information Technology, submitting an amendment to a contract with PeerPlace Networks, LLC, uh, for an off-the-shelf cloud-based comprehensive case management system. And it's for the period August 4th, 2014, through July 31st, 2019, to change the terms, effective November 26th, 2018, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $24,000. Chanel Green, Department of IT. Um, this system is a case management system used by a DSAS and FCFC um, um, divisions as part of HHS. Um, this would allow, this $24,000 would uh, be for time and materials charges, um, which will allow uh, changes uh, to the system to be, to be made depending on business need. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Mr. McLaren. Go ahead. You know, can you talk a little bit about what changes uh, we plan on making with this software? Um, specifically, I don't have that. I have Greg Sherman here from HHS who may be able to answer some of those questions. Hi, this is Greg Sherman from HHS. The specific changes uh, depend on, this, on the uh, agency. Um, they have a list of, uh, a laundry list of enhancements that they're looking to get done uh, this, this year uh, coming up, and there's always some, some changes that they they want to do it with their processors, at, et cetera. So uh, it's an ongoing list of uh, concerns that they have, and they, and, they, and they prioritize them as appropriate. Will the $24,000 cover all the list of proposed changes? So this is where, uh, this is why we've asked about the, um, the change in the contract. So there was uh, some, uh, some money that was unspent previously. Um, the contract pre previously was pretty rigid and had certain deliverables. That were uh, that were uh, some of them were met and some of them were not necessary. So this proposed amendment um, changes the contract so that um, we could use the previously allocated money uh, for some of these enhancements that they're looking to accomplish. Further questions? Yes, Councilman Miller. <coughs> Follow-up question: If you include the money that you're able to repurpose because of the change of, of terms plus the additional 24,000, does that enable you to accomplish everything that's on the list of desired improvements? I believe so. And uh, could you say a little bit about the 46%, 54% uh, split on the, on the funding source, why it was done that way? So I believe is it fifty four. Yeah, that's the the breakdown of the HHS levy um, index code. It's not we not that we specified it to be broken up that way. That's how the index code is. I, I believe yeah. Uh, the, the, there's a certain percentage paid by the levy and certain percentage paid by us. Paid by the so it's it's just it's a funding source thing. I believe. Does this does this. Uh, contract include some things that are HHS and some things that are not HHS and no uh, this contract is uh, entirely for uh, for uh, the two di two divisions of HHS which which are uh, uh, Department of senior adult, senior adult services and uh, family children first council specifically for them the funding uh, the way the funding is allocated is there's 54 percent that comes out of one source and 46 out of a different source how was that determined? It's, I think, by 
in terms of, so the, 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 the contract is for the entire amount, but the, the way that the, uh, the, the funding happens is 54% of that contract happens from one, from, I'm trying to remember which, one, which source from is. From the levy. Yeah, so 54% comes directly from the levy, and then 46% the comes way. from, oh, is it, okay, then it's. It, Bob, can you, uh, is this for e-money, or what is the federal state? Do you know? It could be, yeah, it could be for special services tax, could be for, for yeah. any of those services. Those funds are primarily just for uh, local charities. So uh, my assumption is that this is dictated by federal. Uh, right. You know, this is the maximum federal we'd be able to get for this particular service is my guess. I'm just speculating. Okay. I don't yeah. think this is something that we allocated. Sure. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-838, Department of Information Technology, recommending an award on requisition 42478 and enter into a contract with Weisberg Consulting, Inc. in the amount not to exceed $10,620 for the purchase of a net IQ e-directory server, software licenses, and maintenance services. And it's for the period November 26, 2018 through November 25th, 2019. Thank you, Janelle Green from the Department of IT. Uh, this is an authentication service for uh, our VPN licenses for uh, contractors or vendors um, who remote into our systems. Um, this particular um, service from Weisberg was the lowest cost um, service that we could find. Um, firstly, this was informally bid, but also we looked at other uh, solutions that were actually um, more expensive, including upgrading some of our systems and things like that, would've, which would have cost us um, in the tens of thousands and upward. Um, most of the charges are for uh, the installation services. Um, what it equates to uh, is about 97 cents per user um, for VPN access, and it can be expanded for um, other security purposes. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. McAleer. General, were they the only bidder then for the actual bid? I believe they were the only bidder for this informal service. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by. Councilman Miller, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. And uh, going back to the previous item, just to further note uh, on uh, Councilman Miller's question, uh, what I was told in our pre-meeting was that the 54% is coming from the Older Americans Act and TANF. Mm -hmm. And I think that was uh, DSAS was the... Uh, uh, TANF funds, or the older American side, sorry. <coughs> okay. Next item, BC 2018-839, Department of Information Technology, recommending, an, recommending to amend board approval number BC 2018-692, dated October 15, 2018, which authorized an RFP exemption and an award on requisition 43773 to EP Technology, Inc. for the purchase of miscellaneous operating supplies for Microplex F6 from Microplex F 60 HD and F 90 HD mainframe printers by changing the not to exceed award amount from $3,874 to $5,093. Janelle Green, Department of IT. Um, this one was to correct um, an incorrect quote. Um, the vendor um, supply erroneous charges that actually placed um, the items below their cost. So um, while we attempted to hold them to the quote that they actually bid on, um, we, could not come, we, could, we could not come to terms. So um, we did actually uh, relent and agree to uh, try to get this approved um, at the increased price of the $5,093, which is still um, at around the same price of the other supplies that we've, we've gotten from this vendor in the past. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. McLear. Janelle, if it was an RFP exemption, it, are they the only uh, company that can provide these supplies? 
Yes, um, with this one, we've had, we've submitted, um, I believe, sole source authorization for this vendor uh, multiple times. They're the only ones that um, that the vendor of the manufacturer is allowing to service the Cleveland area. There is another vendor in Columbus, but they're not allowed to service this area. Keep the sole source. Yes. Further questions? Seeing none. Oh, I see a question. Lenora Lanka, Office of Procurement and Diversity. What's the statement on the sole source? This was not approved as a sole source purchase. No, um, at this for this purchase, this one we try, um, was not. We did this as an um, ORC exemption um, because at the time the vendor did not want to um, do the sole source. But prior ones to that, they did do the sole source affidavit. Okay, I just want to make sure the record stands that the. The award that we are amending today was an RFP exemption. It was not a sole source award. Right, but we have had sole source um, affidavits from this vendor in the past. Mr. Chair, just, just as follow-up, if they're the <coughs> only provider that can provide the supplies, why were they reluctant to fill out the sole source affidavit? Um, according to the vendor, um, with the, the newer um, documents that we have posted, they were reluctant to fill them out. Their legal team um, were reluctant to do so. That's a little surprising if they're the only authorized vendor. Understood. But unfortunately, um, their law department um, did not want them to complete that one um, at that time. Councilwoman Baker. So they're the only vendor. Mm -hmm. They increased their price. No, this they actually quoted us. They misquoted us. Um, so the price that they gave us was less than what they actually pay. And um, and during the the process of us getting the other one, this this last one approved, they noted that that they sent us that incorrect amount. So it wasn't about um, an increase in price; is that they misquoted what they were giving us. Okay. And the reasons for not sole source by them is did they give a reason other than they just didn't want to? Their legal department told them not to do so. I mean, that was the only thing that they the only reason they gave us. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Chair, See I'm, puzzled looks. Well, I, I, I'm okay with because it's, it's. I guess originally it was an RFP exemption, but if if a company is the only company that can provide something, I mean, hearing that they're reluctant to sign a sole source just just doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't understand that. If they're the only provider that can provide. Well, I, we've we've had this conversation. I'm not sure. I recall how this comes out, but. If they're not the only provider, uh, they're the only ones that can do this and and do it with the permission of the whatever. <coughs> but there are other company. There's another company in Columbus, but they're not allowed to do it. Does that mean that this is a sole source? That's the one thing I don't recall the answer to. Yeah, that, I mean that that's a good question because if they're willing to do it on other, you know, in the past. What, what's well, that's a good question. What, why know. are they willing to do it now? I mean, with the price, I understand they might have misquoted us, but now the price is going up nearly, you know, 10%. So I just, I, and it's not a lot of money, uh, you know, in, in the grand scheme of the contract. So it just does, it seems a little odd that they would be reluctant to, to, to do it. I mean, it's not the first time we've gotten that from a vendor either. We've had some, um, uh, we actually had it from another vendor um, that we got approved um, under the other, as Ohio Revised Code stated, their legal team told them the very same thing. So um, the vendors are, re are reluctant to, to sign off on it, especially if they're regionally approved versus, you know, throughout the whole state or being the only vendor that supplies that they're technically not. Karen, do you know what would happen if we did get supplies from someone else? What, what would happen? Are we, do we have a maintenance contract with the, pr from the printing, the printer company? We have it with EP Technology. Okay. Th I guess then what, what would be the advantage I if we did do, do a competitive bid on this and another company came in and gave us supply? Um, usually the, the manufacturers set who can, you know, who 
can bid on certain things. I think that in this case, it would be a waste of time if we do that because EP technology would then again be the only vendor that would would apply for it. So then we've exhausted um, on an informal basis. If it, we did it that way, that would be a few weeks versus doing an R, a full on RFP, that would be probably a few months on something we would end up with the same result. Potentially. Potentially. Further questions? Councilman Miller. Regardless of this nonsense, I think we need to keep the printers running. And I think that you know, makes if, sense. If, if we say, if we say no, EP Technologies is going to say, well, we're not going to supply them, and, and, and you, you know, uh, and uh, so I move approval. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Dever. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. BC 2018-840, Office of Innovation and Performance, recommending an award on requisition 43146 and enter into a contract with Ascendant Strategy Management Group, LLC, in the amount not to exceed $72,133.33 for the provision of a performance management software solution to support data collection, analysis, and reporting of performance measures. And it's for the period December 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2020. Uh, Catherine Tkachuk, Office of Innovation and Performance. So this contract is to allow us to take in performance measures on the strategic plan that the county released in 2017. We have about 150 measures that we'll be wanting to report on publicly on our progress towards the strategic plan goals. So this is a contract that we did through um, an RFP process where we received four bids on it, um, evaluated those, and selected this group as the um, the best solution for it. We also looked into the option of having the ERP do this, but uh, we're told that because of the public reporting piece of it and some of it, that the cost of that, the estimate to make the updates to that would be about $250,000, which is why we went through with this process as um, the most um, economical. Again, I think as the ERP comes online and maybe um, there's potential to look at that as a long-term solution, but for right now, that this, this was the best option. Thank you. Questions? Councilwoman Baker. Um, yes, and you know, trying to read through here all that this will be doing. Um, this is what to, to gauge the um, the county on performance measures, objectives, initiatives, and action items. What type? Can you give me a little? But for so we have um, again on the county strategic plan goals. So for example, some of our programs around um, economic development will identify the jobs that have been created and the funding sources that are going into that, and we can report on that publicly along with just community indicator measures that we don't necessarily control, but we think it's a good idea for the community to have that, things like the um, poverty rate. So all of those things, we'll report on it, um, provide some context around the measures so it's not just numbers, share what we're doing to try and improve that, um, as well as in some cases share comparative measures of other counties that are similar so that we can have all of that information um, and report that out publicly. Aren't there resources already out there that gives you poverty numbers and economic development has, of course, their, they've done a pretty extensive review of their, mm -hmm. what they've been doing and what they hope to do and their, isn't there, I mean, what do we, why do we need to hire another management group to tell us what perhaps we're already doing? So this isn't a management group, this is just the software to be able to report on this all publicly. So some, those um, examples, one, it's trying to make it all in one location so it's easy to see related to the strategic plan. Like I said, there's about 150 different measures that we're looking at reporting on across this. So they're not telling us what to do. This is just a software solution to allow us to post that publicly, share what we're doing, um, and share our progress towards those goals. Is the um, 72,000 for only the installation of the new software or does it include the analysis that goes with it? It's for the installation as well as the licenses that go. The analysis will be done, a lot of it will be done with my staff as well, working with departments and those that collect it. Um, but it'll be the licenses for the two years as well. So the licenses that we're paying for is a two year license? Uh, yes. And that's the reason why we need two years in order to complete installing the software is because 
it also includes a license? Right, yes. Yeah. So the, the software will be installed. Um, we'll, we'll do that early next year. We'll complete the install, but then to have the licenses go through 2020 um, to enter the information and then unlimited um, user access to view all the information so anybody will be able to view the information. And those viewing this information will be done in-house? Uh, well, we're also looking to report on this in a, in a public way, too, so that the public can also see our progress towards ma our strategic plan goals. But I mean the, the analysis of it will be done in-house. Yes. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Dever. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-841, Department of Communications, submitting an amendment to a contract with Social Bakers AS for social analytics and publishing services. And it's for the period July 27, 2016 through August 31st, 2018, to extend the time period to October 31st, 2019, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $9,479. Good morning, Miranda Pamika with the Department of Communications. Um, this is for a contract amendment with Social Bakers, which is a social media analytics and publishing platform. Um, social Bakers allows us to analyze 11 social media profiles, including Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It uh, gives us the ability to analyze our posts to see how well we are doing with a number of interactions, including likes, comments, and shares. And it also allows us to compare our page performance against competitors. Um, and our competitors are um, other la large counties that we can benchmark ourselves against. And it also gives us the ability to um, post to four social media pages. Thank you. Questions? Councilman Miller? Why is this being submitted two months after the contract is signed? Um, so this item was stuck in tech for um, quite a while. Um, we have not been um, receiving services in the meantime. So um, the original um, start date, as you can see, was supposed to be um, September 1st. But we were able to work with the vendor to um, allow us to you know, start it now and then end it um, at the end of October of next year. As I recall, when these extensions came in late, they, they used to require an RFC exemption. Is that not required anymore? Lenora Lockett, Office of Procurement and Diversity. Um, it was our interpretation from the board, frequent questions on that matter, that we decided to no longer do the RFC exemption for late amendments or late contracts because the date is always indicated on the item, so it would still be noted when the contract effective period time period. Any other questions? Councilwoman Baker? Will this be analyzed in-house? Is the communication department going to do the work of analyzing, or will you outsource that? No, it'll be done in-house in the communications department. Follow up with a report of what you find, or does that stay just within your department? Um, we do. We have a um, social media plan and goals is what we called it. So we're, um, you know, we're continuously recording how well we're, we're doing. Um, and we're also including this data in the um, the performance measurements. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? S seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next uh, <laughs> is a group. Yes, the next following items will be uh, read into the record collectively and they can be approved collectively. Item numbers BC 2018, 842 through 858, rec uh, Department of Public Safety and Justice Services recommending awards on various requisitions to various municipalities in the total amount not to exceed $206,249.50 for various programs in connection with the fiscal year 2017 and fiscal year 2018 assistance to firefighters grant program. And it's for the period December 1st, 2018 through October 31st, 2019 for the following three programs, implementation of the operations and safety program, for uh, implementation of the fiscal year 2018 Bulletproof Vest Partnership Program, and for <clears throat> let's 
excuse me, staffing an adequate fire and emergency response grant program for the various municipalities and the total amounts listed and indicated on the printed agenda. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Mary Beth Vaughn from Public Safety. And as you recall, we received a special allocation in our budget in order to help communities with local matches for grants that they apply for. Um, with the exception of one, which will be the bulletproof vest that I'll talk about in a minute, um, all of these fire departments made application to FEMA for uh, two different grants, either the assistance to firefighters or the SAFER grant. The first one for Bay Village, they applied for assistance to firefighters. They received a federal um, award of $137,048, and they're going to be purchasing 22 self-contained breathing apparatus. The city of Rexville is receiving $95,239 from FEMA, and they're receiving an exhaust re uh, removal system for the firehouse. The city of East Cleveland, this is the staffing for adequate fire and emergency operations or their SAFER grant. This, they received a three-year award in the amount of $825,000, and this is actually to hire nine firefighters. The county's local match will only be 50% of the first year of this grant. The next is the city of East Cleveland also received a grant, they received two grant awards from the Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program. One is to purchase an ambulance, and the other is to purchase 18 um, turnout gear, which are the hoods, the gloves, the helmets, and that that are used by their fire department, uh, firefighters. The city of East Cleveland also approached public safety. They approached the county um, late last year. They really needed assistance with their uh, replacing their bulletproof vests. Bulletproof vests typically have a lifespan of about five years and they recommend replacement. The city of East Cleveland's far exceeded that. We were able to identify a grant for this and we pointed them in the direction the city um, made application and then they've asked the county if we would just make the local match for that. So they um, received a Department of Justice award for 15 bulletproof vests. Department of Justice will be providing them 15,585 and then the 50% match is the same that the county will be providing. The city of Fairview Park, this is an assistance to firefighter grant and they received $113,162 from FEMA. They are going to be getting 18 self-contained breathing apparatus. The city of Independence is receiving $23,380 from FEMA, and they're going to be replacing their attack hoses and their supply hoses. The city of Lyndhurst is receiving $53,326 from FEMA, and they're going to get an exhaust system for their fire station. The city of Maple Heights was the other um, community that also made application to FEMA for assistance for firefighters, um, to actually for staffing. And so they are going to be able to hire three frontline officers. They received a three-year award of $597,654. And just like with East Cleveland, the county's match on this grant will just be 50% of the first year award. Maple Heights also received an assistance to firefighters grant. And they are for that, they're receiving $145,605 from FEMA. And they're going to be getting 21 self-contained breathing apparatus in addition to some additional face pieces, um, intervention kits, and other accessories. The city of Mayfield Heights receiving $126,791 from FEMA. They will be getting 17 self-contained breathing apparatus as well as additional face pieces. Middleburg Heights is receiving $46,693 from FEMA and they're going to be getting a fire station alarm system along with smoke detectors, horns, and strobes. City of South Euclid is receiving $134,801 from FEMA, and they're going to be getting 20 self-contained breathing apparatus as well as additional face pieces. Olmstead Township is getting $118,629 from FEMA, and what they're doing is getting uh, technical rescue equipment they're also going to be getting the training so that they can certify some of their uh, 14 of their staff members to become certified in rope rescue, swift water rescue, confined space rescue, and technical uh, rescue and structural collapse. Cuyahoga Heights is receiving $110,524 from FEMA. 
They'll be purchasing 20 self-contained breathing apparatus. Highland Hills is receiving $65,715 from FEMA. They'll be getting a vehicle exhaust system for their fire station. And then Newburgh Heights is receiving $83,200 from FEMA. They'll be getting 12 self-contained breathing apparatus and additional face pieces and voice amplifiers. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, a few <laughs> questions. For those grants where it's to hire new employees, are they then responsible for the budget once that grant period expires to keep those folks employed? Yes, that is a condition of the grant. Do we have a relationship with that portion of the grant? No. In fact, the, um, the grant on that, for those grants, they are required to give a 25% match the first year, 50% 50 the next year, and 75% the third year so that they, make, they build into that transition of accepting 100% responsibility. We don't actually have any responsibility on the grant. We are solely making the, the um, reimbursement for the local match. So we have no responsibility moving forward. We have no responsibility actually moving after what we committed to for the first year. Okay, one other question. Mm -hmm. Who makes the ultimate determination on how much each one of these cities gets? Is it based on their application of FEMA or does somebody in public safety actually make a decision as to which city gets what amount of money? What our approach is is that we actually look at, first they have to get an accepted award from FEMA. Then we look at the amount of money that we have available and we look at their performance on previous grants. So we did, there is another community that we did not fund even though they did get a FEMA award because they, we are still waiting for them to deliver on the contract that we entered into them in 2016. But so, I mean, is it a committee or is it somebody at public safety, that act, the director that signs off? It's actually a group of us within public safety who that discuss No it. outside members? Or, no, not okay. in this one. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions? Councilman Miller? What community is it that you're waiting on? City of Cleveland. Councilwoman Baker. So if, is there any cost to the city? If uh, the grant, for example, with City of Independence is 383000 and we're giving to match 1168 is there any cost that the city has in this? Um, no direct cost, just the staff cost for the procurement and making the purchases, but no. So, for example, of the City of Independence, 383000 plus the 1168 is the total of what everything will be. That is correct. And that's how you come up with the 1168 because that finishes what it is that they need? That was, their, that was the local match requirement. The local match that FEMA set actually will vary based on the population of the community. So all of these that we're matching are to make the city whole? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve the items uh, 842 to 858. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. All the items pass. Next item, item number BC 2018-859, Department of Public Safety and Justice Services, recommending an award on requisition 43220 and to enter into a contract with APHIS and Biometrics Consulting, Inc. in the amount not to exceed $46,500 for automated fingerprint identification system assessment services. And it's for the period November 26, 2018 through March 1, 2019. This contract is for an assessment of the automated fingerprint identification system that is used by the medical examiner's office as well as other law enforcement agencies in the county. The vendor will be doing an assessment of the current system, um, looking at the customer and agency needs, de delivering an action plan, and making recommendations for fu future growth. We issued a formal request for proposal. We did receive three responses, and the recommendation is to the highest rated proposal, who also happened to be the lowest cost proposal. Thank you. Questions? Seeing, oh, Councilwoman Baker. So this is just for the assessment. That's correct. So once they assess, then it'll be perhaps who will there be a grant to manage whatever it is that they're um, recommending? 
Do you, do you want to take that? Steve Shannon from the medical examiner's office. So the automated fingerprint identification system, which we currently have, is all going to be approaching end of life. End of life. Um, How many years is that? Uh, it's been over 10 already. So um, we were informed that they will no longer uh, maintain the system after, I believe, August of 2020. Okay. So uh, the assessment that's being done is going to be focused on basically the needs of all the users now. Mm -hmm. It was originally designed to be a regional system was not fully implemented, but there are regional partners like Lorain County um, and other agencies throughout Cuyahoga County that utilize different various uh, pieces of the system. Um, the assessment will look at those needs uh, and looking down the road for what we call next gen. Next gen is really technology that is being currently developed. Mm -hmm. um, that price tag, uh, we're not entirely sure uh, what it's going to be. Uh, I'm guessing it's going to be multiple millions of dollars since the last system cost a couple of million dollars 10 years ago. Um, those resources have not yet been I identified. Um, when we purchased the original system, Cuyahoga County, Cleveland, and this region was receiving in the neighborhood of 12 to 14 million dollars a year in homeland security grants and that is no longer the case mm -hmm. uh, we are lucky to get a million or two a year now um, so it's going to take us uh, some years not only to identify possible sources but to then start accumulating it so mm -hmm. um, if there is grant money available we will certainly seek it out and public safety Mary Beth's team have been very uh, um, aggressive in seeking out those opportunities for us. Any thoughts with technology, especially 10 years ago to today, sometimes things go down in price because technology has made it more efficient, less equipment, um, you know, less time perhaps to, uh, any thought of that it, that it could go that way? So that is the case for, as I said, we are looking now at end of life in 2020. Uh, next gen, we're looking at somewhere in the 2024, 20, 25 range. The interim solution, uh, which is already budgeted for in the medical examiner's um, ME lab fund, is going to be in the neighborhood of $750,000. Okay. Um, so in that respect, using kind of technology that already exists, that cost has come down. And that system overhaul upgrade we call uh, will get us through the next five or six years okay. until we're able to get to next gen and identify those resources and accumulate enough money to actually purchase them. All right. Good. Good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, sir. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-860, Department of Public Safety and Justice Services, recommending an award on requisition 43020 and enter into a contract with TransUnion Risk and Alternative Data Solutions, Inc., in the amount not to exceed $14,256 for online investigation services for the Northeast Ohio Regional Fusion Center. And it's for the period November 27th, 2018 through November 26th, 2020. This contract will, uh, will allow the Fusion Center to perform searches and bring data into from multiple sources into a single working environment. It actually allows the data to conform to the f way the Fusion Center works. It gives them customizable reports and it also will allow them to leverage Google Maps to visualize data and to run associate and web analytics. This is actually replacing a contract that we have with Quest Publishing. We did go out and solicit for um, quotes and the recommendation is to go with the lowest cost vendor who happens to, uh, this new contract will also be lower than what we're currently paying. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is, oh, we have a question. Lenora Lockett, Office of Procurement and Diversity. This vendor, I could not find them on the, 
ID registration list. So um, unless you, based on the documentation, I didn't find an alternate name for the company. Okay. So I would recommend it that we make it contingent upon registration. And this will be amended to reflect that. Further, any other questions? Mr. McAleer. Is this uh, the entire cost of the contract, or um, is the city putting any money towards the contract? No, this is the entire cost of the contract. I was in the video. I'm just making sure. For any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve as amended. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-861, is going to be a two-part item. We are amending the item to add an RFP exemption. Court of Common Pleas, Juvenile Court Division A, submitting an RFP exemption on requisition 43700, which will result in an award recommendations to various providers in the total amount not to exceed $220,500 for trauma-informed residential treatment services. And it's for the period October 1st, 2018 through September 30th, 2019, for the following providers, A, Clarinda Youth Corporation, doing business as Clarinda Academy, uh, B, Grace Haven, Inc., C, Keystone Richland Center, LLC, doing business as Foundations for Living, D, Ohio Guidestone, E, The Village Network, F, Woodward Youth Corporation, doing business as Forest Ridge Youth Services, and G, Youth for Tomorrow, New Life Center, Inc., Good morning, Sarah Baker with Juvenile Court. Uh, Juvenile Court was recently awarded um, another year of BOCA funding, which is the Victim of Crime Act funding. Um, and this <coughs> particular service of um, trauma residential services was written into that grant um, with all of these vendors included. Um, this will provide the youth on our safe harbor docket any sort of residential treatment that they may need. Thank you. Any questions? Councilman Miller. Why is it almost two months late? We didn't even receive notification of the grant award until mid to late October, and then by the time we got the contract done and into the system for approval, that kind of brought us up to this date. Um, a lot of times we don't hear back um, regarding grant awards until after they've already begun, unfortunately. This, is this a new contract or, or is this a continuation? It's a new contract. And currently, we have no youth and residential treatment under this program. The same providers? No. Okay. Move approval. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-862, is also a two-part item. We are amending the item to add the RFP exemption. Court of Common Pleas, Juvenile Court Division A, submitting an RFP exemption on requisition 43709, which will result in award recommendations to various providers in the total amount not to exceed $55,000 for safe space housing services for court-referred youth. And it's for the period October 1st, 2018 through September 30th, 2019. And B, recommending the awards in connection with said RFP exemption for A, Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry, and B, the Village Network. Sarah Baker with Juvenile Court. This is also part of the VOCA grant award that we receive. This provides safe space housing for youth on the safe harbor docket. And what that is is a 21 day or less um, placement for those youth where we can get an assessment completed and get a treatment plan started. And they're in a safe place, they're in one place, we can find them. And this way they're also out of our detention center. Thank you. Questions? Councilwoman Baker. Again, I believe this is also, um, this is the 10-1-28 contract? Yes. So um, why is the lateness on that also? It is the same as uh, the prior, yes. Um, we didn't get notice of the award until after it already had begun. Um, and right now we have no youth in our safe space um, placements. Do you ever see that changing or can we anticipate this will always be late? Um, with some of our grants, we are made aware ahead of time before they actually begin but most of the grants that we receive we don't hear notification or get the official letter until after they've begun 
and we must have the contract state 10-1. We can't state it as 12-1. Um, in instances of the grants, we need them to match. If this was any other program that wasn't grant funded, we could switch the date without an issue, but because of the grant, we need it to match. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-863, Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Reentry, submitting an amendment to an agreement with Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas for Reentry Court Intensive Probation Supervision Services. And it's for the period March 1st, 2011 through December 31st, 2017, to extend the time period to December 31st, 2019, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $131,000. Crystal Bryan with the Office of Reentry. The reentry court is a diversionary docket, much like a drug court. It serves 40 to 65 individuals on an annual basis. It is ran through Nancy Margaret Russo and it has been in place since 2011. It um, serves the most intensive individuals coming home in terms of returnees. Um, they have a long, intensive record and therefore it requires a great deal of supervision to ensure low recidivism rates. It pays for a court position, and so this individual is responsible for coordinating services, case planning for these individuals, maintaining the dockets, and ensuring compliance for these individuals. Thank you. Any questions? Councilwoman Baker. So this is 100% HHS levy funds, no grants involved in this. Why does this contract end at the end of 2017, and we're now approaching at the end of 2018? and we're asking for this extension. Sure, this grant is, well not grant, this award or item is 100% levy funded. And so this amendment was completed in December of 2017. The Office of Reentry had a processing issue uh, or error. And so when it was uploaded, the wrong contract was in fact uploaded. And it was our failure not to notice this until August of 2018 when the funds were encumbered. At that point, we no longer made any other payouts and now are, we are attempting to remedy the issue. So if I understand you correctly, um, we have been paying on this even though we were out of contract? That is correct. We have paid on this from January 1 up until August of 2018. So when the documents were uploaded incorrectly by another department, our failure was that we only read the initial document of the upload, which was the cover sheet, and we should have read the full contract to ensure that we had the right one. And so we weren't placed on notice because of our failure until we actually seen that the funds had been decertified and encumbered, and after that, it placed us on notice. Therefore, we made no additional payouts after that time. Uh, you know, Dennis Kennedy, do, do you have any, ish, any comments on that? I, mean, um, I, I would have to check into that, Ms. Baker, to, to see how the invoices came over. I believe you said that there was an encumbrance that was set aside, and then it was decertified. There was an encumbrance. However, I brought our physical officer, Bonnie Thomas, to answer questions about how it was actually paid out through that time frame should you had a, have additional questions. So Bonnie may be able to answer or remedy what it is you're asking right now. We can only go against, if there's an encumbrance out there, then you know the folks on our end make the payment as long as there's funds that are certified. So okay. um, I wouldn't have been able to detect that there wasn't a contract in place until that point where that Encumbrance got decertified, but maybe Bonnie, you can. Yeah. Trouble with Bonnie, excuse me, Bonnie Thomas, Office of Reentry. What happened was we did have residual funds in the uh, contract because this contract has been in existence since 2011. What happened was there were, once it was decertified, originally the month funds were put into the contract. Later, the funds were decertified. I did not catch. Uh, catch that it, uh, catch that the funds had been decertified until I could no longer uh, do could, I could until I could no longer in, uh, pay our invoices. So that's, that's kind of like what happened. I'll uh, look into the details and get back to everybody with a response. Mm -hmm. Councilman Miller. How much of the $131,000 has already been spent? None. 
because the 131,000 is for is for two years, 2018 and 2017. So I'm sorry, 2018 and 2019. So uh, the money that was was spent after the contract expired, that's money that had already been previously yes. appropriated. Yes. Okay. Further questions? Mr. McElroy. Quick one, can you talk a little bit about the success rate of the program? Are you seeing lower recidivism rates versus? So yes, there are, I don't have the actual outcomes for you all in terms of being present today, but based off their docket and what Judge Russo does, she does have a lower recidivism rate in terms of who she serves because they're the highest risk offenders. They may have violent crimes, multiple crimes, et cetera. How individuals are referred is this a self-referring process. They are applying through an application to be a part of that docket. They're actually still serving a sentence. So much like a motion for a judicial release, except it's an application process. If she chooses to accept those individuals, those higher risk offenders and places her the arms of the court around them, they traditionally do a lot better, more so because they see her every week and because she has that one particular officer only working with um, the offenders and bringing people in on a weekly basis, making sure she's linking clients, et cetera. And so she also provides um, additional report measures in terms of cost savings. Unfortunately, it's a cost savings to the state being our DRC uh, prison system and not our county. I can't give you statistics, but I can tell you she is fabulous. Uh, she d gives personal involvement. She goes down. She interviews people personally to get into this program. She follows up personally. It, it's it's pretty amazing. And much like some of the things we've heard today, this started out as a grant. It was not always levy funded. Unfortunately, there were no existing grant dollars, so this partnership exists. Further questions? Councilwoman Baker. Just to wrap up the money, um, when... Uh, how much has been spent to date on since it expired till now? Do we know what that is? Is the 131,000 primarily from this date forward to the end of uh, 19? I think if, and I may be incorrect and Bonnie may have to step in, but I think with how Bonnie answered this is that none of that 131 has been spent and since Right. January to August, it must have been residuals or existing dollars from the um, former reentry court contracts because it's been so long standing. If I'm incorrect, please step in. You are correct. Okay, so there are no money in the rears yet to pay. No. And I have some figures here. The original contract was fifty thousand dollars. The um, First Amendment was 67,000, the Second Amendment was 67,000, the Third Amendment was 67,000, Fourth Amendment was 67,000, now this is 131. I, that I can't tell you, I don't have that. No ma'am, it's um, 65.5 annually. So it takes care of now this year and 2019. So 131 takes care of two years? Yes ma'am. So it would be 60000 or whatever a year. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Further questions? Thank you. Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Item passes. Next item, BC 2018-864. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Offices of Reentry, submitting an amendment to an agreement with Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas for intensive probation supervision services in connection with the Veterans Treatment Court Program. And it's for the period July 1st, 2015 through December 31st, 2018, to extend the time period to December 31st, 2019, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $65,500. Good morning, Crystal Bryant, Office of Reentry. Very similar to the Reentry Court Partnership, Veterans Court 2 also funds a position that keeps their courtroom running, um, ensures that individuals who are not eligible for DD-214 status are receiving services, um, and also the referrals are made a little bit differently for Veterans Court. So there can be some open referrals from the prosecutor's office, open referrals from different common pleas court judges, and there, there can also be open referrals directly from Reentry Court. So Judge Russo's staff identifies individuals who may 
have veteran status, and then they refer them over to Judge Michael Jackson. So I know there has been some questions, I believe, about um, seeking additional funds and support. In July of July 26 of 2018, uh, our office approached the Corrections Planning Board, who's the awardee of this contract, and we talked about additional potential funding sources for this potential project, and at that time we were told that the Veterans Service Commission did not have the resources, and that we can revisit in first quarter of 2019 about how they would continue to support this project, as it is um, a good thing to have to support veterans who may not have been, um, I guess, in good standing when they left the uh, military. Thank you. Questions? Mr. McAleer. Mr. Chair, not a question, but just to add, you know, the County Council and the County Executive gave you know, $28,000 from the Veterans Services Commission leftover budget to the uh, Veterans Court as well. So um, it was 2075 this year. So mm -hmm. that's another form of support that is provided by the county. Thank you. That's good information for me when I approach our first quarter meeting. <laughs> Councilwoman Baker. The um, H-63 that we just passed is for intensive probation supervision, and this is also, but it's targeted to veterans. Is the 65,000, which is equal to the 863 for the year, are, is there, are there that many veterans that are equal to the population that are not veterans? Do you understand what I'm asking? I'm sorry, Councilwoman, I don't. Okay, so the people that we serve in 863 are not veterans. That's just the population that exists that are, are new to those services. So technically, these individuals have, in fact, served time. However, to receive um, benefits and certain services through our federal government, you have to be, I can't think of the appropriate termination, but you have to be in some way of a good standing. And a good standing is the DD-214, which kind of signifies that. So sometimes if you happen to get um, a criminal record or you were discharged early, you may not be in good standing for those supportive services, but you still serve time in our military. And as a result, the um, our common police court has chosen to wrap their arms around those individuals who may have that criminal background. They may suffer from some level of trauma. It may be theft. Um, and they do intensive supervision with these individuals who are returnees like any other individual or potential probationers. However, they have that additional status of have, have serving time in the military. Does that answer? So, so they, they, veterans actually get both. They, yeah. get, they get both services is what you're saying. So they can overlap. No, they can't overlap because they may be eligible for the federal services. It's not likely that they're eligible for those DD-214 services, but if they are, the role of that probation officer in which the Office of Reentry provides the financial support is to screen and ensure that they're not. So they shouldn't have a duplication because it's that officer's role to ensure whatever source they can use first, they do. And then if they can't, there are no additional resources. That's when you tap into the pot of whatever continued support we have throughout our various HHS agencies. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-865, Department of Health and Human Services, Community Initiatives Division, Family and Children First Council, recommending an award on requisition 43868 and enter into a contract with Educational Service Center of Cuyahoga County in the amount not to exceed $459,972 for fiscal agent services for families and schools together and parent services programs. And it's for the period January 1st, 2019 through December 31st, 2019. Good afternoon, Kathleen Johnson, Family Children First Council. This is for a contract with Educational Services Center to provide the um, payments to the school districts that provide the, who are involved with our Families and Schools Together program and for our parent service programs. Um, families and Schools Together has been in Cuyahoga County since 2010. Um, we're currently in 18 school districts throughout um, Cuyahoga County. We have seven in Parma, five in Cleveland, one in South Euclid, three in Cleveland Heights, one in Berea, and one in Brooklyn. Um, the number of schools could change from the fall semester to the spring semester. Um, we are the number one site in the country for this program. And the parent component is that we have to pay um, parents who attend our Family and Children First Council full council meetings, a small stipend for their attendance and to be a part of our full council. Thank you. Councilman Miller. Nope. Okay. Okay. 
seconded uh, by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-866, is going to be amended. It's a two-part item. We are adding the RFP exemption. A, submit, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Children and Family Services. A, submitting an RFP exemption on requisition 43049, which will result in award recommendations to various providers in the total amount not to exceed $400,000 for adoption services. And it's for the period January 1st, 2019 through December 31st, 2020 and be recommending the awards in connection with said RFP exemptions for the various providers listed on the printed agenda. Uh, good afternoon, Bob Mapp for the Department of Health and Human Service on behalf of Children and Family Services. This is entering into a new two-year uh, master contract we're going to be getting January 1st um, with a variety of option providers. Under the Ohio Administrative Code, uh, families that are allowed to select their own adoption uh, agency of their, you know, of their choice to help facilitate their adoption. And the, these agencies that are listed on this master contract are ones that families have used over the past several years. You know, someone will continue to use them. Periodically, uh, a family chooses a, a provider that's not on our list, and that's when we add a provider. Um, and again, this is all covered with state dollars, and it's not competitively procured because under the OAC that families can can select their own adoption agency. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Mr. Nora. This is Nora Lockett, Office of Procurement and Diversity. I have two comments. The first is that there are two vendors that are not currently registered, and we know that they may not reach the 10,000, but because it's a master, but just in case, so it's noted for the record that they're not. And that's um, vendor A, a family of, uh, for every child, and vendor I, Families First Incorporated. And the second comment is that I will be recusing myself because I can't recall whether my brother works for a Cre Cleveland Christian Home or Christian Children's Home. So I'm going to recuse myself. Thank you. Um, do we need an amendment to make this contingent or just simply they can't use them until, uh, until they're certified by the inspector? Um, Lenore Lockett, Office of Community Diversity. And discussions with the inspector general is on the vendor to know that when they reach the 10,000 that they're going to have to register. Yep. Um, but I just want to know that because there is a potential, this is a master contract up to 400,000, but they are the only two that are not registered at this point. Okay, so there's nothing we have to do right now. No. <laughs> Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're on to the consent agenda 867 to 871. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda items 867 to 871, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Items pass. Thank you. Is there any other business? No other business at this time. Good. May I just ask one question, if you don't mind? You may. Um, Councilwoman and I Baker. I know I already approved it, but I'm just curious of the, of the use. On the... Um, 2018-871, the CT18-44056. I know there's been a lot of talk about children and family services and their communication tools and how they can perhaps um, be more effective. Which one are you on? On the 44056 CF18 for $23,994. Number two on the uh, item of, um, I'm sorry, under the purchases item, it's number two for the 60 tablets. For the Apple iPad tablets? Yes. Is that what you're referring to? Number okay. three, the 60 Apple iPad tablets for the Division of Children and Family Services, is that just to bring more communication efficiencies 
to what they do? Uh, Dan Basta, Health and Human Services, on behalf of Children and Family Services. Um, this is actually for the uh, Electronic Data Management System program. It's not only used by Division of Children and Family Services, it's also used by workers at Job and Family Services. Okay. We made sure that all 60 of those iPads were LTE. Uh, they were able to use LTE technology, which means they'd be able to ping cell phone towers, so they'll be able to use these items while they're in the field. Is this a new tool, though? Yeah. Like uh, what yes. were they doing before they had these 60 they, iPads? They, uh, they were using iPads that they had, but they would have to go to Wi-Fi areas. I see. So it's just... Just more accessible. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you for sure. that explanation. Uh, any other comments or business? Uh, any public comment? No public comment. I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Dever. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you.